your speaker in a mute mode and be ready for the program. Thank you. Good afternoon, Jakarta time and good morning, Irish time. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to ask everyone to please listen to the national anthem of Indonesia Raya for about two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you to the talent scouting program for the Indonesian, Indonesian lecturers with education in Ireland. This program is co-hosted by the director of uh, the director of resources and the education in Ireland. My name is Anis Abdiliawati and I will be your MC for this program. We will set the ball rolling by having the director of resources, Dr. Mohammad Sofwan Effendi, to deliver a brief note on this program. Without further ado, I will now invite the director of resources, Dr. Mohammad Sofwan Effendi. Time is yours. Acting the Director General of Higher Education, Professor Nizam. Her Excellency Ambassador of Ireland, Ibu Olivia Leslie, Regional Manager ASEAN, Education in Ireland, Ibu Elizabeth McHenry, colleague from Director General of Higher Education, Ministry of National Education and Culture, distinguished speaker from Irish universities, and ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, Indonesia, and good morning in Ireland. On behalf of the organizer, please allow me to extend our warmest welcome to the talent scouting for Indonesian lectures with education in Ireland. Held online with the first time in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemics, this program is one of our efforts to increase the readiness of Indonesian lectures to compete for their doctoral degrees at the best university in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Historically, collaboration in a talent scouting program between Director General Higher Education of Indonesia and Irish University has started last year since 2019. 
following the signing of scholarship agreement between the Director General of Science, Technology and Higher Education mm -hmm. Resources of Indonesian Ministry of Research, Technology and Higher Education at the time at the Irish University Association on April 2, 2019. Last year, not many academics from Ireland delivered a session in our talent scouting program. But this time, we have six of them, thanks to education in Ireland. This Irish speaker will deliver various topics, including higher education in Ireland, how to find the right supervisor for doctoral study, research-based product commercialization, opportunity and challenges, internet of things for education, and responses to COVID-19 at an Irish university. Professor Nizam and Her Excellency Ambassadors, we proudly report this, this talent scouting for Indonesian lecture with education in Ireland received 1,098 applicants. Unfortunately, due to this limited quota, we had sought them out and leave only 470 people to participate in this event. Such a large number of applicants show that the enthusiasm of Indonesian lecture for capacity building program is very high. And this is a serious concern and challenge for us at the Directorate of Resources. Therefore, I would like to take this opportunity to extend our deepest gratitude to the Director General of Your Education, Professor Nizam, Her Excellency Ambassador, Ms. Ibu Olivia Leslie, and our colleagues from Education in Ireland, as well as academic from Irish University who support the talent scouting for Indonesian lectures in particular, and the Indonesian capacity building program in general. I would also like to apologize for any inconvenience that may arise during this event. Finally, I would like to sincerely invite the Director General, Professor Nizam, to open the event officially. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Muhammad Sofan Effendi for the short report on this program. And now it is an honor for me to invite the Honorable Acting Director General of Higher Education Professor Nizam to deliver the opening remarks and open this program officially. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Nizam. Thank you, Ms. Anis. Uh, Her Excellency Ambassador of Ireland, Ibu Olivia Leslie, uh, Regional Manager of Asia Education in Ireland, Ibu Elizabeth McHenry, uh, Director of Human Resources, uh, Sofan. Dr. Sofan and distinguished speakers of Irish universities, colleagues uh, from all over Indonesia, Pak John Pariworo, my old friend. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, Ireland. Good afternoon, Jakarta and all parts of Indonesia. Uh, it's been an honor for me to uh, meet you in this afternoon and this event, a very uh, important event. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, our sincere appreciations to Her Excellency Ambassador for uh, supporting this program and also for all colleagues that uh, has joined this meeting and to hear from uh, our colleagues from Ireland on education in uh, Ireland. As you uh, know, the President already announced that human resource development will be our focus in the next five years development. And now we are implementing all the vision of the president as well as what has been uh, articulated by uh, Ministry Nadim, Ministry of Education and Culture, through what we call the uh, Campus Merdeka, Merdeka Pleasure of Freedom for Education, uh, in which we open up our campuses to engage closely to industry and to give more experiential learning to our students. In the higher education, every higher education students can have two semesters, up to one year out of campus to develop their talents, to uh, experience in industry, to work in village and to do many things 
uh, to improve their readiness for job as well as to make them uh, become future proof. And behind all of that, uh, we need a very talented lecturers with broad mindedness and also a good understanding of global uh, issues. Therefore, this program, Talent Scouting for uh, Indonesian Lecturer with uh, Education in Ireland, will be a very significant uh, input for the development of the program in Indonesia. During this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we see a quite uh, leapfrogging in productivity of our lecturers and our students. Although we work from home, study from home, but in the past three months, the publications of our lecturer is exceeding the normal time. And at the same time, many products has been uh, resulted from research uh, and development by uh, many campuses in Indonesia uh, from uh, protective clothing uh, uh, to uh, medical equipments like uh, ventilators, uh, robots for uh, helping nurse and many uh, amazing development has been uh, result uh, has result from the three months of working from home, study from home, and that shows that uh, in a, in the in the event of uh, adversity like this COVID nineteen, actually many creative uh, energy comes out, and we do hope that this can be maintained. And with collaborations with, uh, with Irish colleagues, we hope that a stronger collaboration with Indonesia and, and Ireland will get stronger and stronger from time to time. And we are looking forward also to welcome uh, Irish students and lecturers to come to Indonesia to share their uh, experience as well as to learn each other uh, culture and each other uh, knowledge and uh, talents. So with that mobility, uh, reciprocal direction, we hope that uh, we strengthen our friendship, strengthen our collaborations and having mutual uh, programs together. Uh, and with Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I would like to uh, officially open the Talent Scouting for Indonesia lecturers with education in uh, Ireland officially open. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Nizam. Ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged to have Her Excellency Ambassador of Ireland, Ibu Olivia Leslie, to join us today and deliver the second remarks. Now I would like to invite Her Excellency Ambassador Ibu Olivia Lesti, time is yours. Salamat sore and good morning to everybody in, in Ireland, to our friends in Ireland. Thank you very much, Ibu Anit. Salamat uh, sore. Salamat sore. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sufendi, and thank you as well to the Acting Director General, Professor Nizam. Uh, it is a pleasure to be, uh, to be speaking to so many of you. I hope that we'll be able to see each other in person again soon. Um, when things are, uh, the, when the transition period is over. Um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Olivia and I'm Ireland's ambassador here in, my, in Indonesia. It's my pleasure to take part in today's session and I want to sincerely thank our partners in the ministry um, and my own colleagues in education in Ireland and the third level institutions who are participating. And uh, delighted as well to see so many of you joining from across Indonesia. Um, uh, I was really happy and surprised to see how many people had applied to join this session. Um, and to me, that's a really encouraging sign that uh, Ireland has done something right in reaching out to the third level institutions. And we are very grateful for the faith that the ministry has put in us as well to allow us to, to engage with, with, with your audience like this. Um, and to everybody out there who I can't see on the screen, I hope you are all keeping well. These really are quite challenging times for everyone, including for the education arena. And I was absolutely delighted to hear there about the increase in research during this period of working from home um, and uh, during this period of isolation. 
we have experienced something similar in Ireland with a lot more research papers coming out. And it's great to see so many people taking this opportunity to maybe look at research that they mightn't have had time to do before. More generally speaking, I wanted to say that Ireland is very committed to the of our third level partnership between our two countries. Um, and you, many of you will know that, um, as referenced, we have a number of agreements signed, etc. Um, and we really want to be part of helping you achieve your government's objectives around developing human resources. Uh, we know ourselves that uh, human resources is what leads to the type of growth that we're all looking to achieve, type of economic growth, societal growth, etc. So we really want to be involved in that process. And as well as being involved here in Indonesia, we also believe that we have a lot to learn and gain from relationships between the ministries, obviously, but also between our third level institutions. And I absolutely share the desire of the ministry to see more Irish students here and Irish researchers here. And during my two years here now, I've been delighted to welcome so many colleagues from the universities and from the third level institutions in Ireland to welcome them here to Indonesia. And I know that all of them have had really enriching experiences. So we thank you and we thank the institutions for that as well. Um, and as, as I've said, a lot, has been, um, a lot has been achieved in the last few years, and I was lucky to meet uh, your new minister um, a few months ago now, uh, when we were still able to, to have meetings, and I really emphasised that to him, that we want to build on the successful programmes. And I know today we're uh, talking a little bit about the talent scouting um, programme and the skills development for your, for your leaders, uh, for your university leaders and your lecturers. And the academic bridging program that was launched last year, to me really is a great, is a great sign of, of the strength of, of the relationship and, I, and a really a fantastic start to a program that I hope we will be able to ensure into the future. Um, and I know that the first round really um, uh, delivered some quite significant results and we're looking forward to moving, uh, moving forward with that when we move beyond the current challenges that we're all facing. Um, I'm also delighted that discussions over the next two days will cover research-based research product commercialization and technology transfer. Now, Ireland has a particularly strong record in this area, and the research ecosystem in Ireland is really quite, um, you know, provides quite exceptional supports to our academics and those who wish to develop commercial products. And, and uh, the Acting Director General spoke about some of the, the work that's been going on in your, in your institutes around, say, the development of um, uh, ventilators. And, and interestingly enough, Ireland is, a, is a, a big producer of ventilators. We've had research institutes working on this as well. So it's great to see that, you know, the type of, that there is some uh, commonalities between some of the work that we're doing. Now, the third level sector in Ireland and the government bodies which support re uh, research and innovation have really worked hard to, um, I suppose, develop a culture of commercialization uh, to empower people working in the, in the institutes. And, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from some of our uh, Irish colleagues today and, and from others about how you do that and uh, you know, what experiences that we can share and what we can, what we can learn from each other um, around this, including, for example, um, how the Irish government and its agencies support this type of work through funding. So I will finish, I will wrap up there. Thank you so much again to the uh, Acting Director General, um, to Dr. Savendi, to Ivo Anis, and to all the colleagues. Thank you for your continued support as we grow our relationship. And I'm really looking forward to hearing some of the, some of the exchanges over the next couple of days. Thank you again. Thank you, Her Excellency. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the end of the opening ceremony for this program. I would like to thank Ibu Olivia Leslie, Professor Nizam, and Dr. Mohamed Sofwan Effendi once again for taking your busy time uh, to join us today. And now you may leave this meeting if you wish. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. I'm going to stay for a little bit, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Mr. Ambassadors. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, the next session will be moderated by Dr. John Pariwono. So I would like to invite Dr. John Pariwono to take over the next session. Dr. John Pariwono, time is all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Banis. Ladies and gentlemen, good sore, selamat afternoon, or I could say also good pagi, or selamat morning in Ireland. Um, before we start, I think we will hear just one song or one music um, arrangement as an icebreaker. Please. Hello. I don't hear anything. Hello, Mas Awi. Please um, turn on the music for one song. There's a slight technical problem. Please be patient. Hello? Hello. Uh, Pajun, so sorry, there's uh, the problem. Maybe uh, the song uh, will be uh, played, uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, after Later. the discussion. Please okay. go on, Pajun. Yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, could you uh, hear us? Um, now we will start our session. The first session will be delivered by Miss Elizabeth McHenry. I will um, read a brief resume of her. She is the Regional Manager Asia for Education in Ireland. And she has been um, in the Enterprise Ireland for about 24 years. And she has a vast experience on that. She obtained her degree from the University College of Dublin. And at the moment, she works with both uh, private sector higher education institutions to help them, private and, and, and public, of course, to help them grow their business in their areas. Her responsibility is to set up a new market development across Asia, focuses on China and Southeast. Uh, Asian countries. Uh, Miss, I could say, um, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I just thank you very much. I see you've got my first slide. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be with you all this morning, uh, this afternoon for you. Uh, and to be able to talk with you and tell you a little bit about Ireland and also about the great relationship that Ireland and Indonesia have developed over the, the, the last numbers of years. Uh, I have to admit, I've been to Indonesia quite a number of times and I find it to be a very beautiful country. So I'm delighted to be with you this morning and I look forward to the time I can be with you again in person. Uh, if we could go to the next slide now, please. Um, we have a great team working with yourselves in Indonesia. Uh, my name, as you know, is Elizabeth McHenry, and I'm based out of Dublin. 
Uh, Miranda Ho is our education consultant and many of you will know her. She's based in Jakarta. And we also are working with Isabel Walton, who's a market advisor based in Singapore. Uh, Isabel can't be with us, unfortunately, this morning as she is running um, a briefing for Indonesian agents, in fact, on a separate Teams meeting. But so she would love to say hello to everybody that she knows, particularly those of you uh, that she's met before. If you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, Ireland, as many of you may know, is, a, is quite a small country. We've only got a population of 4.95 million, which is very small in comparison with yourselves in Indonesia. Um, we are at the moment the only English speaking country in the European Union now that Britain has exited the European Union. We have a very long um, uh, history of education in this country. Um, we have monks who wrote the very famous Book of Kells, and they went out and educated many people across Europe. This was followed by our many religious orders who have educated lots of people around the world to, in various Asian countries. And in fact, we're delighted, um, I'm delighted as I go through Asia to discover how many people in this edition of Ireland have actually studied in Ireland as well. So we have a long tradition of excellent education in this country, and it's something we, we value. We are also a very innovative, dynamic country with a young population and for many, for this reason, the education and the young population, many of the world's international countries have chosen Ireland as their European headquarters. So our country is home to headquarters, for example, of face, uh, European headquarters, for example, of Facebook and Google and various other countries. We also have strengths in, uh, in areas that are particularly important at the moment. We have a, a strong pharmaceutical company base and also a strong base in medical technologies. Uh, and financial services is also becoming more important for us now with Britain's exit from the European Union. If we go to the next slide, please. We have a, a small but excellent group of universities and colleges in the country. Uh, we have a program at the moment where our institutes of technologies are coming together to form technological universities. And we were delighted recently to announce the merger of Cork Institute of Technology and the Tralee Institute of Technology to become the, our second technology university, and that's Munster Technology University. We see this as a great way to strengthen the research um, in our country and also give people an, uh, an um, an opportunity to study a slightly different way from how you would in a university. We also have quite a number of very strong private colleges who have been out visiting with yourselves in Indonesia. All our education institutions are in the top 5% uh, of colleges in the world, and many of the individual courses are either in the top 50 or the top 100 places. We're home, uh, this slide is a little bit out of date, but we're home to nearly 20,000 international students. Yes, thank you, if you can move to the next slide. Obviously, we're all in, uh, having to live through this very difficult situation of COVID-19 having affected all of the countries all over the world. But Ireland has taken um, an evidence-led, sensible, measured approach to this. Um, our Prime Minister, our, our senior government leader, what we call the Taoiseach, he's actually a medical doctor. And I think that has helped us to have a measured approach to how we handled the um, pandemic here in this country. Uh, we went into a partial lockdown on the 13th of March where schools and all uh, uh, third level institutions were closed. And in fact, we went into a full lockdown then on the 27th of March. We are now starting to reopen the country and we are in phase two. Um, and our cases, I'm delighted to say now we have fewer than 50 a day at the moment. So we're absolutely delighted for all the hard work everybody did by staying at home, staying indoors. and. It, it looks like we're getting on top of the pandemic now. So we are now allowed out of our houses, but we're being encouraged to stay local. So if you'd like to move to the next slide, please. We obviously were very concerned about the international students studying in our country when the pandemic hit. Uh, about 50% of the students who were here, uh, in fact, returned to their home countries and the rest of them stayed here in Ireland. The government, uh, uh, on, put in a number of measures to help protect people in Ireland and international students, I'm delighted to say, were covered by all of these. Um, 
Any student who might have come down with COVID-19 uh, had access to free healthcare in this country. The government also instituted some legislation which meant that nobody was allowed to be evicted from their homes. So students were given security of tenure in, in, in the places they were staying. And in fact, if they had a job that they lost as a result of, the, of COVID-19, they were able to benefit from an unemployment benefit that was given to everybody in this country. And that particular benefit was worth 350 euros a week. And that's still ongoing for any students remaining in, this, in Ireland. Um, in, colleges also were very good at looking after the individual students. They uh, immediately rally round. And uh, in fact, students were given generally a body of a, a staff member or someone like that who would stay in touch with them and make sure that all their needs were met. As these international students who stayed in Ireland transitioned to online lectures and then ultimately they, had, they did their exams online. If you'd like to move to the next slide. Um, there's a lot of uh, planning going on at the moment for September. Uh, I'm delighted that, to say that we will only have to, um, our opening of all our colleges and institutes is now on the 10th of August and term time has been delayed by a couple of weeks to the 28th of September. Um, as, many, as many colleges around the world are doing, there will be both in-person and online uh, teaching from September on. Where the classes are particularly large, it will be online, where the classes or tutorials or uh, practicals are smaller, they will be in person. Um, so as you can imagine, there are a huge, huge number of logistical issues being worked on at the moment to have everything in place for September. If we move to the next slide, please. So as you can see, uh, the situation is that the government have a five phase, a five phase reopening, and we are now on the second phase. And um, we hope that the country will be fully open by the 10th of August. And as I said earlier, with the number of cases going down, we are confident that we'll be in a position to do that. Um, we had in total about 25,000 cases in this country. If we go to the next slide, please. So here, I, I understand that you will all be given copies of these presentations. And so here are some useful links. If you have any questions about education in Ireland, there is a list of our website, our, our website link is there. And in fact, everything to do with the COVID-19 situation is updated on a regular basis on our website. Also, if you need any further information on how the government's handling it, you'll find it on gov.ie. And then issues on immigration and visas, etc., are all on the immigration and visa part of gov.ie. We'd like to go to the next slide. So um, I'm, I'm delighted to say my colleague Miranda does a fantastic job of supporting us all here in Indonesia and helping further the cooperation between the two countries. So I'll encourage you to follow her on her Instagram page. We also have a Facebook page. Um, Miranda has worked very hard um, with uh, over the last numbers of, of, of months, having live Instagram interviews with alumni, with current students, um, and talking about what it's like to learn and study in Ireland. And as I mentioned, my colleague Isabel is this morning holding another briefing with education agents this morning, uh, showcasing a number of Irish colleges to them. And we'll continue to do as much as we can to promote education in Ireland in Indonesia and answer any questions you might have. We'll do that both online and hopefully in person as soon as we possibly can. Next slide, please. So here are just a series of photographs, which I think are lovely photographs, which show you the commitment that Ireland has to Indonesia and indeed what Indonesia has to Ireland. This first slide is uh, in fact of an in-person talent scouting day that was held in uh, 2019. And as you can see, there's a, a group of people there, including a number of Irish um, universities. Next slide, please. And again, uh, University of, Ar of Galway, of Ireland in Galway, and University of Limerick at a, a talent scouting day in, in Denpasar. Uh, and a number of those of you who are on this presentation this morning, I can see the faces. And here I'm, sorry, yes, if you go to the next slide, delighted to show uh, the next picture. Sorry, the next photograph, please. Yep. Oh, oh gosh, we went to, anyway, one of those photographs was a photograph of 
uh, a number of you who are here this morning actually visiting us with us in Ireland. And it's absolutely fantastic that you have been with us three times. And in fact, I don't know if we can go back to the photograph. There we go. Yes, you'll see there the weather was quite different for, for everybody in Ireland. You can see all the coats and jackets there. Um, but it was wonderful that you, you came to visit us. That's from January, the most, the most recent visit. But it's fantastic that you've made the trip over to us three times. Um, and then the final, uh, if we go back to the final slide, that's just a, sorry, if you go to the next slide. The, the, the other slide was just a very happy slide um, of when the MOU was signed between Ireland and Indonesia. So there, which Irish Universities Association uh, and this uh, Ristikti. So that was a, a wonderful day and we're looking forward to all the progress we're going to continue to make uh, after um, as we go as we as we go on uh, over the next uh, years and months. So I'd like to say thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to talk to you this morning. If you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat box and we'd be very happy to ask. If you want to do any follow-ups, I'm I'm here, or as I said, my colleague Miranda, who's based in Jakarta, can answer any of your questions. And I look forward to staying with you now this morning to uh, hearing the rest of this program. And I'm absolutely delighted that so many of you were able to join us this this afternoon. Thank you indeed. Okay, thank you very much, Liz. Or should I say Liz or Lisa? I don't know. Thank you very much for the comprehensive um, information about Ireland, study in Ireland. Okay, now we will go to the next session. And the next session is there will be a five minute break. And during the break, we will hear some music on it. Thank you. Hello, are we?
thank you very much okay. ladies and gentlemen with that short break we will continue our uh, presentation the second presentation is from dr jim connelly um, the title is developing your uh, academic career experience in ireland let me provide you with a brief um, resume of Jim Connolly. Jim is from the NUI Galway, that means National University of Ireland in Galway. He is the curriculum coordinator for the English Language Center. He is expert in EAP, in content and language integrated uh, learning. He has taught in Germany, Australia, Italy, China, and Korea. And his research interest is communicative assessment, teacher development, and interdisciplinary language teaching. Now, Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you. So good morning from Ireland. Uh, it's the afternoon there, so I think I can say uh, Selamat Sode. Um, it's very nice to see many of you again who I know. Um, and there, of course, there are many people who I don't know yet. Um, uh, thank you for attending the, uh, the seminar, the webinar today. Um, so uh, I, as Park John has just said, I'm from the University of Galway, the National University of Ireland in Galway. Um, uh, this is a relatively large university in Ireland. We are one of seven universities and we work together with the other universities in partnership um, with the Irish Universities Association. And what I'd really like to do today is to tell you about a program that we ran last year called the Bridging Program for, uh, for Indonesian PhD candidates who came um, and were to join our course. Now you can see in these first slides here, um, I'm sorry for whoever is going to help me with the slides. Uh, there is a quite a lot of slides because, and you'll have to press forward relatively often. Um, but you can see these animals here, you may recognize them. They are swans. And, uh, and the first picture at the very beginning was a picture of swans on the river in Galway. Galway is a very nice small city with a nice river running through it. And we have lots of swans at the moment. And as we heard from, uh, from earlier speakers, we're just beginning to emerge from our lockdown or transition period and so people can get out and take photographs and what I find when I go out is that there are more animals about than people sometimes. Um, this is the this is the city center here where the river flows through and I think swans are quite nice um, as a symbol for us because we have great stories about swans. One of the famous ones on the next slide is called the the children of Lyr. Um, this is a story about some people who were magically trans, uh, transformed into swans by uh, an evil sorceress. And they spent a very, very long time waiting to reunite as people again. And somehow I felt that that was kind of a good symbol for what we're doing and what we're going through at the moment, uh, because we're waiting to reunite um, with the people that we care for, of course. And uh, I would be very keen to reunite with Indonesian students um, who, who we've met before, and those who came on our, on our bridging program. We go on to the next slide, please. Um, and maybe the next one beyond that. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. What, they participated on a bridging program, which we had in Galway last year. Now this was organized with DICT and together with the Irish Universities Association. And really the plan was that students would participate in this program so that they could then prepare to take a PhD program in Ireland. Um, there were a number of pillars within this program. Uh, we wanted people to improve their, the, the participants to improve their academic and English skills. So you can see the first item there at the top. We'll just stay with that earlier slide, please. The first item at the top was about, oh, okay, okay. Uh, that's a little fast for me, but that's fine. We just stay where you are now, please. Um, there are three different parts of this. Um, the first part was at, uh, focusing on academic skills and we called it English for academic purposes. So what, was the, what would be the English requirements that people would have for PhD study in Ireland? 
Um, and then what would be their uh, approach to finding a PhD supervisor? So we were hoping, of course, to try to link people up with potential PhD supervisors within their department. Um, those people who came last year, coincidentally, were nearly all from the field of English language education, which is something that I'm most interested in myself. So I was very keen to work with them and very happy that the first group who came on a bridging program like this were involved in English language education. Um, okay, now we, we'll, that, that's the opening day when the students came and in our, and in our classroom, there's the classroom. Um, <laughs> yes, there we are. So, so um, we were looking at, at English for academic purposes. We moved, we moved very quickly from, from a kind of tentative, um, not knowing what to do exactly because this was all new for us in our first bridging program to getting into the classroom where we focus very clearly on English for academic purposes. Um, as Park John mentioned at the beginning, I'm quite interested in communicative education and communicative education and assessment techniques. So we were always involved in communicating with each other up and about doing things. And there we are in the classroom trying to learn some, some typical English phrases for the academic uh, writing and listening and reading and so on. Now let's go to the next slide, please. So there are the students in the classroom and I re realized quite quickly that the, that the students were good at taking photographs. Um, and uh, that, that this one here, if you look at it, it's quite interesting because the students all seem very active. Um, I guess I shouldn't call them students because some of them are quite senior um, lecturers in their own universities. I, let's call them the participants. And uh, they cleverly put this photograph together. And I was, I was if I'm the swan at the bottom looking on, um, I'm thinking when I saw the photograph, Wow, that's quite interesting. I've never actually seen them like that in my classroom. Um, and what I realized was that they had organized the photograph, maybe uh, being their own director and set the whole thing up and taken a photograph of themselves to show to their, to their colleagues and friends back home, look at what we're doing and how we're studying and how diligent we are. <laughs> and I thought that's quite unusual because, because we don't normally work quite as effectively as that. So I decided that I would up the ante a little bit and make things a little bit more uh, challenging. So if you look at the next slide, you can see this is a kind of activity that my student, that these participants were, were asked to do. I got them to, to uh, think about something that they were interested in from an academic point of view. We went to um, um, documentary websites. One of them is called the BBC Witness History website, which is quite a nice place to go to get information about history. And, uh, and everybody chose um, an individual program that they would then find information about and they summarized in a piece of academic writing. So here's an essay from one of these people called uh, Professor Gitit. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. You can see another example of a writing task that students did. Um, people were learning paragraph writing. Um, uh, one of our students or participants was interested in, uh, in an area of uh, of literature and using literature as a, as a mechanism of teaching. And so uh, as, a, as an English teacher, that was something that was interesting for her. So she wrote an essay in this style. So our writing tasks were about basically getting people to learn academic writing skills and language and approaches and structures that were useful for them. And people wrote and chose things to write about that were related to their own interests. Let's go on a little bit, please. Next slide. So now the students are actually doing something which is real. This is a photograph that I took myself and students are giving peer feedback. Um, besides, okay, so, so besides learning from me, because people are quite advanced in their own studies themselves, because they're uh, going on to work in, in research, people were very, very independent and very competent. And the feedback that they got from each other was very, very useful and constructive. Okay, now we go to the next slide, please. Besides writing, of course, it's very important if you're going to study in another country where English is the medium of education that you're able to speak. So we created um, uh, tasks, um, many tasks actually for the students to participate in. And, and usually when we were making these tasks, we consulted with the participants together rather than creating a, a task of my own, uh, we did it together with the students' input. So everybody was involved from the, from the creation of the task and the activity to actually participating in it. In this case here, because we were talking or working together with uh, English language teachers, 
um, we decided to think about um, some reading some journal articles which were related to English language teaching. And one particular one was one that we decided that we would have a discussion about. So the picture there shows uh, some of the participants giving their opinions and actually making a presentation for the seminar discussion. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so, so I think you're getting a, a picture of the kind of things that happened in our bridging program from an, academic, an English for academic purposes um, point of view. Um, the, we, of course, we, we had seminar discussion. We also had presentation skills. And the task here, again, it's a task, was to present contents of a journal article relevant to your proposed research. Now, this was really interesting because students real or the participants realized quite quickly that we're not just here to learn about, about uh, academic writing and speaking skills in general, but to try to make it more focused on, your, uh, on their particular interests in terms of what they wanted to do for their research proposals for their PhD. So now um, this was a task that was directly looking at that. And we look at the next slides, please, where the participants were actually performing these presentations. And, uh, and they, everyone did very, very well. Um, there were lots of different uh, approaches that we examined. Uh, you know, when people make presentations sometimes at a conference, they tend to have lots of slides like I have at the moment, and there might be a lot of writing on those slides. And we deviated from those and experimented with some pres presentation techniques. People did extremely well. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Because they were doing so well though, um, we decided to try to up the ante. And so instead of just having a presentation, we also created uh, question and answers um, discussions after each presentation. And you can see that, that, the that the participants actually put each other under quite a lot of pressure because they were studying similar areas of, uh, they had similar study interests and similar research interests. The questions were quite challenging. And, uh, and I discovered that the Komodo dragon is a good is a good symbol of your country, really, because inside every Indonesian participant that I met, there was a dragon lurking inside who wanted to ask difficult questions and challenge all of the others. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so, so English for Academic Purposes was going quite well in this bridging program, but that's not the only thing that we had to work to focus on. So let's go to the next slide and think about the other areas of focus. Next slide, please. Right, so we broke our, our weeks because it, was a, because it was an eight week program. We decided that we would make uh, Fridays a kind of research focused workshop day. And you can see in each of these green um, highlighted areas that we were focusing on everything related to pH study in Ireland. So, so um, we invited um, participat participants to, to meet with representatives within the university in Galway, the National University of Ireland in Galway, and to meet with representatives of our partner universities in Limerick and Cork and Dublin and Maynooth. Um, and the idea was to try to pair people up with potential supervisors for their PhD. So uh, this was something that was going to culminate in a research proposal, which would be hopefully accepted by the, by the potential um, PhD supervisor. And at the very end, we were going to have a research poster presentation that the potential supervisors could then attend. And hopefully we would be able to arrange to have PhDs supervised for these particular participants in Ireland. So let's, we were building towards this. Let's go to the next slide, please. So we invited the dean, of, uh, the dean of research at NUI Galway to come and talk to the participants. That's her circled in the photograph. And we realized that it was important to have to take a very strategic approach in how we would, how we would help these students to find, uh, to find potential supervisors. So we thought about how we would write proposals as, an, as English for academic purposes, then all of the things that we were talking about with academic writing and so on were feeding into this particular process. So to consider what research questions were being involved, uh, what objectives the research would have, what proposed methods would be used in the, in the, uh, in the process, and uh, what the original contribution of this particular piece of research would be. And very importantly, and I think um, um, uh, linking to what people who have spoken already this morning have mentioned, how can this research be transferred technologically 
and commercially perhaps? In other words, what is the impact of the research that was proposed? This was a big focus for us. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. So, so here we arranged for each of the participants to meet potential supervisors. Uh, this was kind of like a speed dating uh, event where we brought the participants and you can see, recognize the Indonesian participants and the Irish participants here who are senior academics in NUI Galway in my own university. So we brought them all together um, from, uh, in this case, it wasn't so difficult because people were all focused on, on, this, on the area of education and English education. So we brought pe people together in one room and people would then have a maybe 15 or 20 minute meeting with a potential supervisor where the supervisor had already read their draft proposals, um, but now they were getting to meet the people individually face to face. And then after a while we would rotate and uh, the participants would meet new potential other supervisors. So everybody met three or four people who might have been interested in, in, uh, in supervising their research at this particular meeting. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, this is the same meeting. Let's go to the next one, please. So there we are, there's everybody who participated and they were all together at the end and very happy to have met potential supervisors who were interested in their research. And it was a very successful meeting because we realized that there was a lot of overlap in the research interests of those supervisors and of the Indonesian participants. So now we started to focus very, very strongly on preparing these um, proposals and making the proposals more, um, I suppose, um, um, presentation ready. So, so we focused, as I said, on impact. And you can see there I am with Nurul, uh, who was making a particular, particularly interesting uh, proposal for research, which was accepted by one of our, our professors at the Department of Education or the School of Education in Galway. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. I think the next slide shows us the posters that people made. Uh, it was very, very hard work, you know, and preparing a poster is not an easy thing to do. Um, and, uh, and especially having it backed up by, by the information that and the research that went into it. But to somehow fizzle it all down into one poster. This is what our students or our participants did. And here are examples of the research posters that they produced. Now, I know that many of you are going to be from a number of different um, uh, academic disciplines, but these people were, these researchers um, and lecturers were from the area of English language education. So the titles there show you the areas that they were quite interested in. The one on the right is, uh, is particularly interesting for me because learner-centered teaching is something that I'm quite interested in myself. So, so um, uh, this particular part participant made a very interesting poster that I was quite interested in. And he was he's planning to bring, uh, to bring his research in uh, Muluku province to Galway so that he can, he can work together with a, with a learning-centered teaching researcher supervisor in Galway, and they can hopefully produce the full PhD together here. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. So the posters were ready, and now we're already at the end of our program, and you can see this is the beginning of our poster presentation session. Posters were all set up in a, in a seminar room, and then the, the uh, people from the relative departments came to visit and see the proposals in their poster presentation. And it was quite nice. Let's go to the next slide, please. As you can see, the, the professors who they met earlier came to, to now see these proposals in, in their poster format and to see how the development of the, of the proposal ideas had progressed. Uh, we had professors uh, uh, from Ireland and also we invited some supervisors to come from other partner universities, including the University of Limerick to this presentation. Let's go to the next slide, please. So basically, here are the, the uh, Indonesian PhD candidates and lecturers, people like you, who participated in this, in this bridging program meeting with their Irish potential supervisors. And it, because, as you can see from the happy photographs, it's been a match. Uh, what's happened is that uh, Sidra on the right-hand side has met a supervisor who she is going to work with or hopefully going to work with 
um, on PhD research. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this, the participants were all particularly pleased with themselves and they all went out to have a meal afterwards and feeling good. And they were right to, um, because they worked extremely hard on this program. Um, it, was a, it was a very intensive eight week program where we were lucky to be able to help people with their academic writing, to hone their proposals, to produce presentation, to, to practice their presentation and speaking, and to actually meet uh, supervisors who they will be able to work with. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so, so we talked about interacting with the partner universities. Um, in, my, in my next couple of slides, I'd like to show you some pictures of the visits that the, that the participants had away from Galway to the other parts of the country where our partner universities are. So let's look at those, please. This is a visit on the left to the University of Cork, the University College Cork, um, where we had arranged for them to meet with the relevant uh, discipline representatives in that university. The photograph on the right is from the University of Limerick. And go on, please. And here we have two photographs from partner universities uh, in, uh, in DCU at the top, that's Dublin City University. And the one at the bottom is called Maynooth University. Um, and one more slide shows the Dublin universities of UCC. And the next slide, please. We've got uh, UCD, that's University College Dublin at the bottom. And at the top, you can see that's, oh, this one is DCU. And we've got Trinity University or Trinity College Dublin, a very famous university in Dublin on the next slide. So our participants were, were able to go to, to each of those areas uh, or each of those universities and meet potential supervisors in those universities too. Um, this was the first time that we arranged this uh, bridging program and from the National University of, of Ireland in Galway, um, I guess because we were newly doing this, we, we, we seemed to uh, take a lot of the responsibility on ourselves. Um, however, together with the, with the Irish Universities Association, we intend when we run these bridging programs in the future to, uh, to have a much more integrated approach or an even more integrated approach where hopefully supervisors will be able to meet all of these uh, potential PhD students, uh, uh, people like you in the future where they can find supervisors at all of our Irish universities. Okay, let's go to the next place. Um, slide, please. Now, um, we talked about Fridays, um, but over the eight weeks, we also worked on, on training. And the reason for these kind of training sessions was so that the participants could get used to the, not only to the English language and academic, um, and the academic language that is required for academic study, in, um, but also to think about what's expected of life in an Irish university. In other words, to find, to have some skills that they would be able to use for, for their studies in Ireland. Um, so we invited the library, for example, to help us with bibliographic software skills. Um, we had uh, representatives of our university who, who came and talked about cross-cultural education, for example. So, and we also, at the bottom, you can see there's also the area of positive mental health, which I think is really, really important and which is brought home to us at the moment in this era of COVID-19. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please, and see some photo photographs of what was happening in these areas. Now, if you're if you're uh, if you've come all the way from an interesting country like Indonesia, which for us is quite exotic, to a place like Ireland, where where the local birds look like ducklings, <laughs> then you might ask yourself, you know, do I fit in here? Do I really want to do a PhD in a place like Ireland? Is this something that's in, that's suitable for me? So if you go to the next slide, you can see we had a, a presentation or a representation from, uh, from many of the students and the participants who participated in the events going on in Ireland. Um, so this was Halloween, which is an Irish festival, and the, and the international office arranged a Halloween party for all the international students. And there is the spirit of Kuntilanak at the National University of Ireland in Galway. Let's go to the next slide. This was arranged by the lady in the center here. Her name is Louise Kelly, and she's the International Student Support Officer at NUI Galway. Um, she also came and ran a, a workshop with our participants on intercultural relations 
and figuring out things like, you know, if I'm living overseas, something that perhaps I haven't done before studying overseas for a lengthy period, uh, what does that involve for me? Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, however, it wasn't all of, it wasn't all about academic focus. Um, the students and the participants also got out of the weekends and got involved in exploring the country. Um, we are an island, and as Indonesians, you're probably used to islands. Um, and the, the map that Rudibek is holding there in his hands is of the Aran Islands, which is a, uh, a, a small arch archipelago just off the coast of Galway, where, uh, where the participants went for a weekend. Let's go to the next slide. Um, fitting in in the country is something that these Indonesian participants were very good at. Um, here we have one of the participants called Fadkur, and he participated in a science day for children at the university and he volunteered. He's wearing his volunteers t-shirt there. And it was really, really lovely for me to see and to witness how these uh, young academics from, from Indonesia got involved in the programs that were going on in our university in this way. Let's look at the next slide. Let's go on to the next slide, please. So this is a, a trip to uh, the countryside near Ireland, or near Galway, um, in the west of Ireland. Okay, now we're coming to the very end of my, of my presentation. Um, this slide here shows pretty much everything that we did in the bridging program. Um, you can see uh, the three columns. The, the first one on the left is our EAP, or English for Academic Purposes, and we had a theme each week. Um, over the eight weeks, and they were all very, very focused on the things that were that the participants would be doing in relation to their discipline and in relation to their uh, their search and quest for a PhD supervisor. Um, the ones in the middle are all our training sessions that took place on Wednesdays. Um, for example, the intercultural uh, education um, processes and positive mental health. And the one at the bottom there is about research ethics, which of course is extremely important in our European universities. Um, and that helps people to go through the processes of research in the education field for those particular students, but also to avoid plagiarism, to think about uh, what, what is involved in ethical research. And then on the workshops on Friday, um, you can see what we what we did here. Uh, we talked about Ireland's structured PhD program approach. Uh, we talked about how to pitch to potential supervisors. We worked on writing successful research proposals. Of course, the participants had already written a, a research proposal before they got here. Our, our plan was to maybe improve those and to make it more uh, suitable for, for what our Irish academics were looking for. We partnered, as I said, with our with our uh, IU, the Irish Universities Association partners, and we created those research poster presentation days. And at the end, all 10 of the participants were offered a supervised position in Galway and in Ireland. Okay, so let's go to the last slide now, please. Um, we hope that many of you would, would equally like to come to Ireland to participate in a bridging program of this type. Um, perhaps you can release your inner dragon, which I'm sure you've got inside you, uh, with integrated support from across our Irish universities. Okay, so that's pretty much everything from me. Um, as previous speakers have said, I think we're going to have a question and answer session a little later. Um, so uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have at that time. Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. You forgot one thing. I think you provide all the participants with a very good hotel. Oh, yes. Hotel rooms, is it? Make That's us right. happy. They were happy with their accommodation, weren't they? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much for the uh, excellent presentation. Now we will go on to the next session which is, um, will be presented by Paul Dillon. It's about research-based products, uh, commercialization, opportunities, and challenges. I would like to um, mention about a brief resume from Paul Dillon. He is from the University of Limerick. 
and he has 50 years working experience in electronic design and development. He is now currently the director of technology transfer office at the University of Limerick. And his specialty is strategic management of intellectual property, intellectual pro uh, property protection and commercialization, university industry research collaboration. And it is, he is responsible for supporting and developing the university's innovative activity. Now, without further ado, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, I'd just like to welcome everyone. Um, my name is Paul Dillon. I'm the director of the Technology Transfer Office at the University of Limerick. Um, I'm here presenting you today from my village, which is called Kokora, which has about 200 people population. Uh, it's about 20 kilometers from the uh, outskirts of Limerick City, which is about roughly about 100,000 people in its urban hinterland. So the University of Limerick is uh, housed at just outside the, uh, in the uh, about six kilometers from the center of the city and forms a critical part of the whole economic infrastructure of the region and is a big driver of innovation within the, the larger Limerick based region. So if you just go to the next slide, please, I'll give a quick overview of what I'm going to try and give you a, a little flavor of today. I'll talk a little bit about, because this is looking at commercialization, I'll touch a little bit about, you know, university having its strategy and policy in respect of commercialization. A lot of universities talk about it, but is it really embedded in their culture? I'll talk a little bit about the services that my office provides. I have a small team of about eight people. Um, we'll touch on the impact that we, we have in terms of our commercialization activities. And I have some case studies I'll talk through. I was asked to mention some challenges, so I'll give a quick summary of what I see as the great challenges, and then we'll wrap up with some conclusions. So, um, so next slide, please. So the university has developed a, a rolling five-year strategy. Uh, we have four pillars in our, in our research strategy. It's called Excellence and Impact. It finishes at the end of this year, and we're currently developing a new strategy for the next four to five years. <clears throat> But I think the key point to make is pillar two, a quarter of our strategy is set aside to impact, the impact of our research. And there's quite a few activities underpinning that, which, um, so we always look at our research now, not in terms of our academic outputs, but in terms of our impact on society. And all researchers are encouraged to, to write impact sections in their grant applications. And this has become now standard within Irish funding bodies they look to see the impact of the research now. And I think EU, European Union has more and more gone this direction as well. We started our impact initiative about seven years ago and it kind of put us slightly ahead of the curve. And uh, it's been running now for, for some, some, some period of time. So um, next slide, please. So in terms of the framework, which we have within the university to support commercialization, we have a policy on intellectual property, as most universities in Ireland would have now, because we're required by a, a national protocol. Um, we have policies on private consulting. Our academics are allowed to consult privately. We have a very strong engagement with, with industry at our university. We have policies to deal with conflicts of interest, but also policies around the formation of campus companies. And we have processes that are written out under a quality management system for the management of intellectual property. Um, the next slide, please. And the most interesting part of our policy is that we, we the university sets out in a written document that it, that's approved by our highest authority, the governing authority, that the university is committed to managing and commercializing research that has the potential to have economic impact. And what the university's policy is, is that we share the benefits that accrue from that activity, the financial benefits. We share those with the inventors. And for those coming from Indonesia, we are irreverent as to who an inventor is once they're listed on a patent application where they come or go, they share in that benefit, uh, no matter whether they continue to stay in the university or they're gone. So um, we have a benefit sharing policy that's set out within the policy itself. And it sets out, um, you know, the financial distribution between the university, the inventors, the research center, the department and the institute. So the next slide, please. And really, we also have a campus company policy. And the purpose of this policy is to set out to say that the university supports the formation of new spin-out companies. 
And we have some procedures that are set out as to how that actually all happens in practice. And the whole purpose of all to do this is to make it clear to people that A, the university encourages this activity and B, the university sets out how researchers should go about it. And this is necessary so that researchers can do it right. That we don't have problems later on. And the proper and orderly formation of a spin-out company can not only help the company, it can help the founders to, to achieve investment and it help the company to progress. And I'll touch on some of this when we, when we show some examples. And it also facilitates the transfer of technology to the company. Um, and we have involvement of heads of department in the giving approval, postdoctoral researchers who want to move out and form their own business. There's a, there's a clear process for everyone involved as to how, how it's approved and, and uh, what's involved for everyone. So next slide, please. And these are the services that uh, my office provides. Um, we have a small team of very specialized people who have largely 10 to 15 years of experience working in industry. I myself worked 15 years in industry and then spent another 10 years working in what were called programs in advanced technology, which were university-based programs to commercialize research. Um, but the main thing is our office enables knowledge transfer to industry from the university. We facilitate engagements with companies with, between the research teams. Uh, we commercialize the IP that the university creates, and we negotiate and handle all the legal agreements relating to an interaction between a company and a research, uh, research staff or team. Um, we support also inward investments. So when companies look to come and set up in the region, we act as the gatekeeper in terms of uh, companies that may be looking for talent they come to, um, and I would work closely with Liam Ryan's office, and we would, we would bring together the relevant parties in the university to showcase what the university has to offer to the company, that if they set up in the region, that we would have the talent available. And um, we facilitate the formation of new companies. And we do this also, we have an incubator on campus now that we manage, which we opened in 2011, which supports both spin-out companies from the university, but also spin-in companies, what we call from within the region. And they would be companies looking to come on campus that want to work with our researchers to develop their own products and processes. So next slide, please. Our focus in providing research and commercialization to the researchers is very much, we are supporting the researcher and the research team. We put them at the center of everything. And all the services we, we provide are directed at supporting the researcher to commercialize their research. Because while we can file patents and all that, we always say 10% of the knowledge is maybe in the patents, but 90% of the knowledge is in the head of the researchers. And the real knowledge as everyone, as you guys as researchers know, there's, you may try 10 things and one will work, but you learn more from the nine things that didn't work than you learn from the one thing that did work. So the knowledge of the nine things in your head is often very valuable. So we, we really focus on the researcher who contains the knowledge and we try and present the researcher and support the researcher to commercialize their research. So next slide, please. And the other support I have, which I'm gonna to touch on is the Nexus Innovation Center. So this is our innovation center that acts as a kind of support hub once you form your business. We provide sports to spin outs and spin ins, as I mentioned before. We have created a large entrepreneur community of about 30 entrepreneurs at this stage. And they, they all help each other and they work together. And we, we put a lot of effort into creating what we call an entrepreneur ecosystem. We also support venture development where we have contacts with venture capitalists and angel investors who provide the capital that is necessary to grow companies in their early stages. The center provides space. We have bioincubation labs as well as offices and hot desks. And then we have a, a very experienced manager who's got a, she's a professional mentor in a former career. And then my office links those startups with the knowledge base when they need uh, both technical and business supports from the university. We run a range of programs which we collaborate with other institutions on, varying from programs for researchers to form teams. We have social entrepreneurship programs and student entrepreneurship programs. So next slide, please. We're very big on measuring everything we do. We, uh, we collect a lot of data, we collect annually. Uh, we do a very big survey every, every January, February. Um, it's part of a national survey called the Annual Knowledge Transfer Survey. And about three years ago, we started to, we publish all our impact metrics at this stage now. And all these metrics are in accordance with national definitions. So, and actually this data is published by every institution, but we publish it also ourselves in our own annual report. And we publish details about our spin outs, about the level of enterprise support, 
um, what we do in terms of technology transfer, in terms of the number of patents we filed, the number of patents we got granted. We do a lot of publication around industry engagement as well in terms of what level of engagement we have with companies, the number of projects, the amount of money received from companies. And uh, next slide, please. And one of the other things we do, we do a five-year look back and you can kind of have a look at how the university is kind of, you know, when you add it up over five years, you can see that quite a significant impact that the university is having in terms of its research activities and the, and the outputs that are derived from those activities. So next slide, please. So I'd like to talk a little bit about our spin out companies. We, um, the University of Limerick has a very strong, our research strengths are in the area of uh, advanced mathematics modeling, biomaterials, uh, including surface science and biomaterials, um, engineering. We have nearly every strand of engineering at the university, including the only aeronautical engineering degree program. But our mechanical aeronautical biomedical engineering program is particularly strong. And they've had a long standing interaction with our graduate, with our graduate medical school and also our local hospital, which we have a strong partnership with. And as a result, we spun out quite a lot of companies in the, uh, what I would call the bioengineering space. And um, these have been quite successful in raising funding and they've gone on to create jobs and grow. Um, so next slide, please. sorry, if you just move on there, there's a, just a, yeah. So they've created over 200 jobs, raised over 85 million in venture capital. And a number of our companies now have been sold and the exit values of those sales have been excess of 250 million. So the, um, so I'll just go into some examples here now. So if you move on, please. So here's an example of a company. We spun it out in 2005. It was a company that came from our electronics engineering department called Parvation. Um, a team, an academic with uh, two postdoctoral researchers and a postgraduate student. They left the company and formed their own business called Parvation. They, over the period of 10 years, they raised 35 million in venture capital. And in 2015, a Japanese company called Ram Semiconductor acquired the company for uh, 75 million, uh, 70 million US dollars. And um, the university made, uh, just to, I mean, it was, it's relative to public knowledge, we made about 1.6 million on the deal. And three of the researchers received in excess of uh, 200,000 euro each as part of our benefit share policy under the intellectual property policy. So, uh, yeah, they made, they made some nice money themselves out of the company as well. So that was a big success story. And I think uh, it reflected well on everyone because largely at this stage, the company had got to about 50 people and most of the company's hires had been PhDs from the University of Limerick. And I think I'll come back to this point about why all this innovation activity, um, why it's important for a university to be involved in it. So next slide, please. So I'd also like to talk a little bit about innovation ecosystems because we've had quite a success in spin outs uh, in microfluidics, which is again coming out of our mechanical aeronautical engineering program. So at the first picture here on the top left, we have Professor Mark Davies and Dr. Tara Dalton, who are two academic staff members from the Department of Mechanical, Bio Biological and Mechanical Engineering. And they formed a company in 2005 called Stokes Bio. In 2011, Stokes Bio was acquired by Life Technology Corporation for 44 million US dollars. But just before the company was acquired, one of Mark's PhD students spun out of Stokes Bio and formed himself his own company called GenCell Bio. And GenCell Bio grew to nearly 100 people and was acquired by a company called Beckton Dickinson, which is a global medical devices company. And they acquired the company for 150 million US dollars. And the lead, in, the lead researcher, uh, sorry, the lead owner of the company was a young 33-year-old, um, Dr. Kieran Kerman, who was Mark's PhD student. And he made so much money on the deal, he, he came out in the top 50 richest people in Ireland overnight. But BD, who acquired GenCell Bio, now have a 200 people R&D facility based about a kilometer from the university. And in 2015, Mark decided he wanted, when he came back into the university after forming his company, he spun a second company out there about three years ago called Hook Bio. And he used some of the proceeds that he made personally from Stokes Bio to get the company off the ground. So we now have an ecosystem of nearly three or four companies all involved in high throughput microfluidics. And just recently in the last month, the university has announced the, a new Institute for Infectious Diseases. And Part of the 
the activities of the university, which has received three and a half uh, million of an initial donation from a founder, is to look at high throughput COVID testing using some of the technologies that have been developed by our spin out companies. And we are talking about thousands of tests per day with a single machine. Um, and we believe we can actually track, uh, crack this problem with some of the technologies that have been developed over the years through these different spin out companies. So next slide, please. So we also are very good at, um, there's a national prize for spin out companies that's given to the best spin out company in a university. And um, it's been running for about five years and we've won it three times in the last five years actually. And these are three of the companies. Osteform was the first one there in the top left is a, a medical device for treating, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, what's called stomas where you have a, um, where the body has a, an open wound effectively. It's a device to help pr prevent infections there. Uh, Hook Bio won an award. And then a company called Solopep developed a small medical device, which actually has applications now in code because it helps clear people's lungs. And then one of our spinners from the business school won the FinTech award for innovation. But I suppose most importantly, we, we got recognized nationally by the government and we were invited um, to bring our incubator, uh, present our incubator, but one of our spin-out companies at the at an Irish government for uh, that was held in government buildings in Dublin, and there was a side, there was a session held on inno innovation kind of um, hubs within universities, and I was asked to bring a researcher who had formed a spin-out company. So I spoke for two minutes, but Jackie Cooney here, who's a professor of biomedical science, stood up and presented how she formed her company from being a researcher. Um, I would say, I don't know if you know the expression, she described herself as a self-styled lab rat. Um, Jackie had no interest in business areas of interest, but she was working with some proteins that um, when she started to look at some research papers, she realized her protein could probably, that she'd been studying for 15 years, could probably play a part in the treatment of sepsis. So she got some commercialization grants from the Enterprise Ireland to help her develop the technology from a, a research finding into a potential product. Um, she spun, we spun a company out called Kayla Medical herself, um, a business friend of hers from Boston Scientific or Boston area, and one of her postdoctoral colleagues. Kayla Medical raised about two million in venture capital, and the company recently secured a five million uh, disruptive technology innovation fund grant. And they're currently developing, uh, going on to develop the solution. Um, they're about three years in existence. So here's a researcher who was very much lab-based researcher, very focused on what interested her and no real interest in uh, impact and application. But um, she stood up and I think most of the politicians that were sitting in the room were completely enthralled by her, very evangelical about her story. And I would say Jackie was so successful because she wasn't looking to form a company she was looking to create a treatment. Um, so the next slide, please. So look, some of the challenges, uh, these are pretty universal. Um, a big part of making sure commercialization happens is to, to, to have incentives for academics. Um, the biggest incentive you can have, in my opinion, is to include it in the metrics for promotion. Um, that's always a struggle to get, but it's, it's, if, if, if it's not part of the promotions policy, that the impact that the researchers research has, then that, uh, that can be difficult. It's you need to have programs where you can help researchers come from a research background to commercialization. And some of our PhDs, our structured PhD programs now, we are looking to bring in what we call a commercialization track into those programs. It's very good to have what we call specific market knowledge. It's very easy to get general market knowledge, but when you want to develop products, you need very specific market knowledge partnering with business because academic researchers on their own, sometimes they struggle with the lack of business knowledge, but if you can get a business partner in the team, then you have this mix of business and technical, which can be very strong. And the other thing that we all struggle with as universities is the readiness of the technology. We call this the technology readiness level. It can be quite early stage, and therefore it needs a lot of development capital. So you need more funding, you need access to that funding. But I would say one of the biggest um, challenges is that researchers have is the ability to communicate their ideas. Some are very naturally good at it and some are not so good because when you want to raise money, you have to, you have to communicate your idea and you have to be have a compelling story. So the next slide, please. So I, 
I'm coming to the end of my talk and you know, what is the key to innovation? So if you just move on, in my view, it's um, just move on, press on please. Um, so the key to innovation in my view is people. And um, you know, what makes the best companies and the best spin outs is bright minds with bright ideas. And what we're doing at the University of Limerick is to try and create a teaching model where our students are more entrepreneurial and more engaged. Um, because we believe that's what the future employers want uh, and, and that that's what we're working on. And we graduate about 4,300 you know, students every year. And our focus is to produce those students who are um, smarter and more agile at thinking. And I think not just have the knowledge, but have the key abilities to actually use and apply the knowledge and have some of the skills to what we call be a job maker, to create their own jobs rather than a job taker, which is to take employment with someone else. So I think my last slide, please. So thank you, and my talk finished. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. It's very interesting. Now we will enter the um, question and answer session. We have time of, say, until 5 o'clock. Right now, we have collected uh, questions, and uh, we select uh, a few of them. And I will ask the question to Liz, and then there are questions to Jim, and also question to Paul. I will uh, read those questions, and you can answer them in turn. Is that okay? Right. Um, certainly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can also chat with them, you know, I have seen the one while the presentation, you chat to uh, either Elizabeth or, um, or, or Jim, questions you are interested in, okay, you can do that while, the, but now, these are the questions to uh, list that, there are three questions. One is from Hassanuddin University. The question is, could you please tell us more information about the scholarship program in Ireland universities? The second question is from the University of Islam, Universitas Islam Indonesia from Jogja. The question is, are there universities in Ireland hosting PhD programs online and the third question for Elizabeth is from University of Gajah Mada. The question, there are two questions. Is there any scheme to enroll to Irish University with scholarship or as PhD researcher? In brackets, PhD with work contract. The second question, how is it the sense of openness of Irish people in terms of foreigners, especially students from Asia? That is from Liz, for Liz. Now, there are three questions for Jim then. I will um, read that. The first one is from University of Muhammadiyah in Grisik, East Java. The question is, is there any English education program that focuses on developing the use of technology in teaching learning process? The second question is from UPN Veteran Yogyakarta. There are two questions. How about the chance of being accepted for PhD programs from the bridging program. The second question is, as you mentioned earlier, the PhD supervisor are interested in the impact of the research. Is there any specific research agenda for the upcoming years in Ireland? And third question comes from University of General Sudirman in Java. The question is, can you explain PhD structure in Ireland? Example, 
requirement, how many years, steps in each year, quality exam for PhD, publication, etc. And from for Paul, there's there's one question. On the startup, the, the, oh, sorry, there is two more actually to Paul. Oh, there are more. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. Um, let me check again for oh, Paul. Wait a sec. I'm downloading the question. To Elizabeth, to Mara, to, oh, to Paul. Paul, the question is this. This is from Unri in Riau, Sumatra. Is there any scholarship you might suggest for me to have a doctoral degree in mechanical engineering or how to apply the bridging program? That's one question. The second question is this. It is perhaps um, easier for a developed university such as University of Limerick in order to have the, you know, the, the startup company and so on. But what is your opinion or your suggestion? If um, the university in Indonesia, a developing university wants to have uh, uh, the same path as that, what is the first step? Thank you very much. All of you have only time until five o'clock. So we start from uh, Liz then. Liz? Elizabeth, uh, John, it seems yes. that Elizabeth lost connection. So perhaps we can move to Paul oh. or Jim. Okay, to Jim first then. Jim, yes. please, could you please answer those questions? Okay, I think you can hear me now, right? <clears throat> yes, correct. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the questions. Um, the first one is about uh, is about teaching using uh, technology, and and that of course is something that's really really in vogue at the moment because of our situation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and actually, yes, I'm I'm aware of a couple of different uh, uh, research projects that are involved there. Um, here in, in the European Union, there is a, a system called the Erasmus uh, Exchange Program, and it's possible for, uh, for non-European countries also to be involved in Erasmus research projects uh, and projects that base on teaching and research how teaching can be improved in the third level. Um, at the moment, I'm aware of one research project that involves uh, a, a number of universities where they're looking at uh, uh, improving or developing technology uh, for education at secondary education level. Um, so if you would, if you like, what I could do there is maybe put you in touch with people who are organizing that particular piece of research, and that might be something that might be useful for, for you. Um, the other thing that, that strikes me immediately is that uh, using technology for, for education and especially language education was one of the, of the research projects of one of the participants on the, research, on the bridging program last, uh, last October and November. Um, his name was Ribe and, um, and I'm also, I would also like maybe to be able to put you in touch. So perhaps Park John or uh, uh, Juni or is, yeah. you. Anis. Can, can perhaps put us in, in, in touch with the person who asked that question and I'll try to answer directly and put people in, uh, together. Okay. Um, sure. Okay, the sec, this, okay, yeah, is, does Anis want to say something? No, please continue. Okay, the second, the second question was with regard to the structure of the PhD. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, Okay, no, the second question was with regard to the chances of being accepted on the PhD program mm -hmm. after the bridging program. So, um, so with regard, I can only speak for the program that we had last uh, year at the end of 2019. Um, you, we, were, we were very enthusiastic at the National University of Ireland in Galway about this particular um, 
bridging program. A lot of resources went into it and people mobilized and got involved in, in ensuring that the Indonesian participants on the program were well received, they, they got a good hearing and that people read their research proposals. Um, our, our proposal posters uh, occasion was very well attended and at the very end of the program, after the eight weeks of the program, we had actually paired each of the uh, candidates who came actually with a very strong proposal already, um, but through the improvement of the, of the proposal, through honing of it, and through meeting um, potential supervisors in Ireland, all 10 of the participants were actually offered a, a PhD position. Um, so most of those were at the university of, in my own university, the National University of Ireland, and one of them was at the University of Limerick, where Paul is also working. So that's 100%. Um, the, the, uh, the chances of that happening again, um, I don't know whether that will happen to the same extent or not. And, and of course, the other problem is that uh, a PhD is an expensive, uh, an expensive thing to undertake. And it's important that there is funding available. So, um, so uh, seeking funding from within U Indonesia, of course, is, is a primary option. Uh, but there are also ways to uh, to apply for funding from the uh, research funding agencies within Ireland. Um, I'm not an expert in that, um, but that is also a possibility. Um, so being accepted is one thing, but uh, actually taking up the PhD position is another, and it's related to to funding, of course. Okay. Um, the uh, the second part of that question was with regard to to impact and and uh, of course we I highlighted impact in the proposal writing process because uh, in in NUI Galway we also have a department which is similar to Paul's division at the University of Limerick uh, we call it the innovation office and uh, and uh, and you asked about the research agenda and uh, how impact is involved in that perhaps Paul you might like to say something in response to that. So, yeah, so I'm, I, I see quite a few questions, but maybe if I, I'll just take a few points. Just to leave, firstly, some people asked about COVID. The current situation in Ireland is if you're coming into the country, you have to self-isolate for 14 days. I, I'm not aware that there's any, uh, it's, it's not policed or it's, it's a self-isolation system. So if you can travel to Ireland, uh, the system at the moment, and I think within Europe, it's likely that people traveling from certain countries in Europe won't even have to self-isolate. So it's it's that's just that question came up. Just in terms of the, the relationship with spin-out companies, um, the spin-out companies are wholly independent companies from the university. The university takes a small share, typically around 15%, but it's a separate legal entity, has its own board management, and it has what we call an arm's length relationship through um, through a legal agreement with the university. The legal agreement gives the company access rights to the intellectual property. But I, I suppose most importantly, I think a few questions come up that, um, which goes back to James' question, which is there are quite a lot of scholarship opportunities for students that I would say, I would point out, which have an industry dimension to them and which allow a student to undertake their PhD or their studies with potentially spending some time involved with a company they're located on the company site or whatever. So I would raise two funding agencies in Ireland that are worth a look. The Irish Research Council would be the first one. And they have funding opportunities or scholarships for PhDs, uh, both and postdoctoral students or postdoctoral fellows. And they have a range of awards. And I, I would encourage people to look at the Irish Research Council website. The other um, area that's worth a look is the, the Science Foundation Ireland. But I think if you want to engage with using S Science Foundation Ireland funding, I would point you to the national centres, which are large national research centres. And at the university, we would have three, such as SSPC, which is involved in pharmaceutical manufacturing, Lira, which is involved in software, and Confirm, which is involved in manuf advanced manufacturing. But the SFI website would list all the SFI centres because largely SFI provide their funding through the centres. But these centers would have significant PhD uh, scholarship opportunities for students. And in these centers, they have a have they have a requirement to have a strong engagement with enterprise and companies. 
So if you have a, an interest in a PhD area that's relevant to one of these centers, Galway would have CONFIRM, which is in, or CURAM, which is in medical devices. These centers are actively pursuing or looking for PhD students or postdoctoral researchers um, with relevant experience. So if your area of exper expertise falls into the area of the, one of these centers, they would have contact points. They're all listed on the Science Foundation Ireland website. And I think um, this would probably be a useful exercise for um, people to look at. There's quite significant funding available in Ireland for scholarships. I mean, about 80% of the research expenditure in Ireland goes into people. And, uh, but the, in the Irish government mandate is that a lot of our research must involve uh, industry. So a lot of our programs for PhDs and postdoctoral fellows actually include a dimension of industry collaboration. And to put in perspective, um, when we do our annual, annual knowledge transfer survey, 50% of our research expenditure is, uh, involves uh, projects with companies. So that, that's a very significant figure. Um, so I don't know, Jim, if that kind of touches on the question. I think there are quite a, a substantial range of funding opportunities for um, people interested in doing PhDs in Ireland where they want to have, let's say, the possibility of collaborating with a, with a company. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, and uh, yeah, thanks a lot, for Paul, for helping me out there. Um, that's really, as I say, that's not really something that I know much about. Um, but I would be able to answer the third question that, that Park John gave to me, which was to uh, to talk about the PhD structure. Um, we in our in the Irish universities, we usually run something called a structured PhD, um, and uh, and people are given up to four years to uh, to complete that. Uh, that structured PhD degree. Um, so, so you have three to four years to do it and four would be the outer maximum, I think. Um, uh, what are the requirements? Well, you have to have a, a master's degree in the di discipline that you're researching. Um, and, uh, and then the, the, ma the major thing is to have a, an idea for, for research. Um, then you would write an application where you would include your proposal and uh, rather than saying, okay, um, we have a particular entry requirement with a certain academic qualification, what will happen usually is the research supervisor will look at your qualifications and your proposal and then decide, I want to take this particular piece of research on for supervision. So, so the decision really lies with the department where the PhD will be, will be hosted and with the supervisor within that department. Um, the, uh, uh, here in Galway, we have, uh, in our part of our structured PhD, we have a requirement for, uh, for all of our PhD students to take a number of credits as well separately to their research. So usually this involves uh, this, the, the PhD student choosing a program of study that they would like. They can arrange this together with their supervisor and often it involves, for example, it might involve some, some uh, if you're a non-native speaker of English, you might decide to take, to take an academic writing um, module as part of that, or you might decide to take something which is related to your own particular uh, research discipline, or you might decide to take something with regard to something like research ethics as an approach to, to how you can approach your research, particularly if it's in the social sciences area where you're dealing with, with people. Um, so the other interesting thing that we have in Ireland is that there is a support team. Um, aside from the supervisor, it's possible that uh, you, may, you may have a, a desire to, to link with other academics. So we have a, a group called the GRA, uh, which is, comp comprises of, of three other academics in the university who will be your liaisons and supporters, and they would be perhaps chosen uh, as people who are part of the research area and people with particular expertise in the, in the discipline that you are researching. So that's, that's kind of a very brief um, kind of outline of, what, of the way that the structured PhD runs in Ireland. Thank you, Jim, for all the questions. Now um, I have to Paul. Paul? There are another two additional questions for you coming from other one. I would like to read that for you. This is the third question from UKWMS. 
uh, for engineering field, it is easy to sell a product or an idea about technology. But what do you think about medical science related to social field, like pharmacoeconomic topic? What kind of product, what kind of product that can be sold to the entrepreneur? That is the, the third question. Now the fourth question is from Erlanga University. Can you explain a little more about the university company? Is it a different entity with the university and how it's related with the university? Thank you. Time is yours, Paul. <laughs> so um, I would disagree that it's easy to sell an engineering product. I think it's, it's very hard to sell any product. <laughs> And I think the answer is very simply to the question, it's for all products. You, you have to find a need that, that has a, a sufficient appetite that would justify a business. And this is the whole key to a business formation that finding the customers, finding the need that your problem, your solution is solving and that no one else has solved uh, is the key to it all. And we do a lot of work when we're looking at commercializing our research we, it's looking at the market, but not just looking at the market, looking at why people buy something. And if you think of yourself when you go into a shop, why you buy, what your motivation to purchase the goods and services are, um, these are the kind of things we like to understand more about. If someone is buying an engineering product, why do they buy it? What value does it bring to them? Um, what features of the product are the most important? And what's most critical? And what decisions influence them in terms of purchasing the product. So it's very much about studying the behavior of people, why they will want to buy the product um, and, and what form that the product will be most attractive to the most amount of people. So we have some concepts we call, what we call the minimal viable product. Engineers are very good at developing lots of technology and solutions, but the biggest problem is they never stop engineering. And the concept of the minimal viable product is the minimum amount of technology that people will actually pay money for. Um, so a lot of the concepts we're using for doing what we call the market research side are, are, are well developed in, you know, in terms of the clinical area, looking at things like unmet clinical need in product design. It's kind of the user centered features, the user design, the user needs. So at the end of the day, it's, it's back to you, the person, the buyer, what drives your behavior. And if I'm going to sell you a product I need to understand you as a customer for my company. So I, I don't think it matters what kind of product is, the concepts are the same for every kind of product in every business, be it a service or be it a product. Um, and the, so the, I really, it's, it's kind of a standard answer to, to all the questions. Um, uh, when you're looking to bring your service or technology to the market, you have to understand your customer base who's going to pay you money, what amount of money they will pay you and what features they want in the product. I give a story about Parvation. It, was, it looked a very successful company, but they, in their first iteration of the product, they developed a chip for, that went into the power supplies uh, of computers. In fact, it went into server farm power supplies. And when they went out to the market, they had this very, very advanced chip that could do a lot of things, but it was costing, I think, $1.50. And the first big customer they, they met, they said, yeah, I like your chip, but I'll pay $1.25 for, for those features. And um, they had to go back actually and spend another, what, 5 million redesigning the chip because they essentially had too many features on it that companies weren't prepared to pay for. And by having a reduced set of features, they could have a cheaper chip. They were able to attract more buyers. It's a good example. Um, can I come in? Um, sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm not so sure whether Elizabeth is, is there, um, but there was a question that was asked or directed to Elizabeth at the beginning about openness to Asian, uh, to yep. Asian students in Ireland. And, and I think that's a very, very relevant uh, question. Elizabeth does seem to be there now. Um, but uh, this was a question that was directed to you earlier, Elizabeth. Um, and, and I'd just like to say that, that my experience, having lived in Asia for quite a long time, um, and then having moved to Ireland with my 
with my Asian family. Um, my children were born in Korea and my wife is Korean. And, uh, and we came to Ireland seven years ago and I've experienced this, I think, partly through the eyes of, of Asians and the Asian community here in Galway. Um, there are, uh, there are, of course, uh, um, there is probably no country which is completely 100% open. And sometimes people have negative experiences. But my overwhelming feeling is that in Galway and in Ireland, we are very open and accepting of other cultures. Um, this is partly because uh, we as an Irish group have uh, a nation, we have experienced immigration ourselves where lots and lots of people have left our country and then gone to live in other countries. So I think as a nation, we understand that, that migration is, uh, is part of what's happening in the world. And, uh, and, uh, and we have now become used to accepting or welcoming people from other countries to Ireland. So there's a growing population of non-Irish people in all our towns and cities, and among them are many Asian people. Um, so, so while it would be foolish to say, no, there's no such thing as, as reluctance to accept um, uh, people from other countries in our, in, here in Ireland, the overwhelming um, experience that people ha have is that it's very open and welcoming. And at all of our university campuses, there is an international office which helps people to integrate and uh, to help them to find accommodation and to settle in and to get used to being in our universities. And we have very large international populations on our campuses. Um, and so if you come as an international student, you'll be one of very many other international students and Asian students on our campuses. Elizabeth? Jim, thank you very much indeed for answering that question so comprehensively. And in fact, you're probably in a better position uh, with your background. <laughs> Asian family to answer that question than I, I am. Just to say, yes, uh, students from all over the world are very welcome in Ireland. As Jim said, I'm sure we do have some people who are resentful, but on the whole, the country is very welcoming to Ireland. And in fact, Asia is actually a part of the world where very many of our students choose to go and travel as soon as they're finished their um, degrees in Ireland. And obviously, when people go and experience other people's cultures, it makes them far more open. So I think we will just see more and more Irish people having an understanding and a love for Asia, which will mean they will be more welcoming. They are currently very welcoming, but they will be more welcoming and more understanding in the future. So apologies earlier. I don't know what happened. The internet threw me out, so I had to come back in again. Okay. Thank you very much for Elizabeth, for Jim, and from Paul, but there might be more questions coming up to you, and I think we can just um, communicate about those questions. This through emails, perhaps, and then we can later on compile all those questions to have seen some sort of uh, questions and answer from um, the presenter. Okay, now uh, thank you very much. We are coming to the end of this, uh, this day session, um, right? This is about um, 17 hours, Indonesian time, Jakarta time. We will have um, a closing um, remarks from Miranda Hoof. She is the education consultant in Indonesia from education in Ireland. Miranda? The floor is yours. Hi. Hello, Pat John. Yes. Floor is yours. Closing remarks. Closing remarks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pat John. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable Acting Director General of Higher Education Ministry of Education and Culture of the Republic of Indonesia, Professor Nizam, Her Excellency Ambassador of Ireland to Indonesia, Olivia Leslie, colleagues from Irish universities and all Indonesian academics who have joined this online uh, webinar today. With the continued engagement by all Irish stakeholders, including the successful visit by Dicti in 2019, Ireland has been a strategic partner for Indonesia in the fields of higher education, technology research, and innovation. 
through this online webinar, we wish to further show our commitment to support the development of human resources in Indonesia, as well as strengthen bilateral relations between both countries and facilitate the improvement of lecture qualifications in universities within the Ministry of Education and Culture. We would like to thank you for being uh, present today. Hopefully the material shared by our colleagues is useful for all. Terima kasih, Pak John. Okay, uh, thank you. Yep, no problem. Now, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, there will be another session tomorrow, starting at um, three o'clock. Yeah. Then prepare yourself. There will be, uh, let me see for tomorrow. Then is, of course, uh, Dr. Yvonne uh, Kavanagh. I hope I pronounce her surname correctly. Dr. Andrew Floss and Professor Gerard Lacey will be the presenter for tomorrow. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. We can accumulate all your questions, but you can lodge your questions through Dicte and Dicte will distribute those questions to the appropriate uh, presenters. Thank you very much. One is, time you, is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Pak John. Pak John, Bu Miranda, Elizabeth, oh. Jim. See you tomorrow. Jim. See you tomorrow, Jim. Just for your, the information to uh, the participants, if any of your colleagues are not invited to uh, this webinar, they can you know, uh, watch our online streaming. Uh, through uh, this, this um, you know, YouTube account. So, thank you so much. See you tomorrow.